Hello and welcome to Food Allergy Canada's webinar on traveling with food allergies. My name is Kyle Dine and I am proud to be hosting this session alongside a team of young travelers who you are going to meet shortly. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that the contents of this presentation and related resources are for informational purposes only. People should talk to their doctor about any concerns or questions they may have regarding their own health or the health of their child. Today, we're going to cover the basics of traveling internationally with food allergies, and we'll talk about the common challenges that many people have, and our wonderful panel will be providing some of their tips and experiences, and then we'll open up to all of you to ask questions. Now, a little bit about me. I have allergies myself to peanut, tree nut, egg, fish, shellfish, mustard, and penicillin. Uh, I'm a consultant for Food Allergy Canada, and I've worked with the organization for the past 10 years. I'm also an educator who does a lot of work in schools, educating children about food allergies uh, in school-wide assemblies in age-appropriate fun way with music and puppets. I'm really excited to host this webinar because I love traveling myself. I'm a co-founder of the website allergytravels.com, which aims to provide helpful food allergy related info and firsthand reviews of different countries and different airlines. I'm also the owner of allergytranslation.com, which provides allergy translation cards in foreign languages, which can be used in restaurants abroad. I've traveled to countries in Asia, Africa, Central America, and Europe, which is my personal favorite. I actually went on exchange in Europe in university and I even got married there. So enough about me, let's meet the panel and I'll ask each one of them to introduce themselves along with their, their allergies, their favorite travel destination and their dream destination. So we'll start off with Ariane. Hi, my name is Ariane and I'm allergic to peanuts, tree nuts, sesame seeds, and freshwater fish. So my favorite travel destination is probably Walt Disney World, mostly because I'm a big kid at heart. And my dream spot for a vacation is Japan because I'm just fascinated by the culture and history of it all. So thanks. Cool, thanks, Ariane. Go ahead, Danielle. Hi, everyone. My name is Danielle. Um, I'm allergic to peanuts, soy, and peas. My favorite travel destination is Definitely Sweden. I've been there three times and I want to go back as soon as possible. In terms of my dream destinations, I kind of have three that are all tied. I really want to get to the Faroe Islands, Greenland, and Svalbard. So I'm hoping to get to the Faroe Islands in the next few years. You are making me excited to travel next. Thanks, Danielle. All right, Julia, go ahead. Hi guys, my name is Julia. So I'm allergic to peanuts, nuts, fish, and shellfish. Uh, my favorite travel destination has to be Costa Rica. I've been a couple times and I cannot wait to go back. Um, and the place I want to travel most, I'm going to have to go with what Ariane said and say somewhere in Asia, either Japan or Korea. Hey, Costa Rica is definitely on my bucket list. Thanks, Julia. Miriam, go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Miriam. Um, I'm allergic to peanuts, tree nuts, fish, soy, and milk. My uh, favorite travel destination or, uh, is the UK because I have a lot of family there and I love it there every time I go there. And my dream destination, I guess, would be where I'm normally, where I'm from, which is Somalia. I, I just want to get it in, more in touch with my roots. Um, and that's me. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Miriam. And you're going to hear a lot more about our panel and their stories and experiences at the end with the Q&A. So uh, before we get into the challenges of travel, let's focus on why we travel. It can be such a wonderful experience. And travel comes in various forms, including backpacking, cruises, resorts, maybe traveling on spring break or doing a big road trip or academic exchange. And plus you'll be introduced to so many amazing things, new cultures, incredible landscapes. You might experience new languages or perspectives. And a uh, topic we'll be discussing a lot tonight, new cuisines. So um, let's dive a little bit more into that. 
But first, I'd love to see uh, what you love most about traveling. And we're going to do a little poll question right now that should pop up on your screen. So what new experience excites you the most about traveling? New cultures, the landscapes in different countries, perhaps language, different perspectives while you're there, or the cuisine. Feel free to put in your vote of what experience excites you the most. And let's see the results. So it's quite a split um, where people really appreciate the different cultures and landscapes, absolutely. And um, some voted for perspectives, cuisine, language, not so much, but um, very, very neat to see. Just it's, it can be so many different things, why we travel and, and that's really an important thing to focus on, not on the challenges, but also on the positives of why we do it. So now let's dig into uh, the challenges of traveling internationally with food allergies. And of course, airline travel is of much concern for many. Different traditional foods, cuisines, uh, food labels and ingredients that we may not be familiar with, language barriers, when communication plays such an important role in staying safe, this becomes such a crucial element to be ready for. Uh, being prepared for emergencies while abroad is key. Although you never hope to need it, it's really important to have a plan. And accommodations. And all of these challenges we will discuss in more detail in the coming slides. And let's do another poll question while we're at it. So this one, what do you feel is the most challenging aspect for you for traveling with a food allergy? Would it be modes of transportation? So airline travel, traditional foods and ingredients. From, so navigating all of the different foods in a, in a foreign country. Language barriers, would that be the most challenging part? Communicating your food allergies with another language? The emergency services in another country or where you're going to stay what are the accommodations so feel free to put in your vote and let's see the results so really it comes down to the food and the ingredients that you might find the different foods different ingredients different cuisines in foreign countries but also language barriers was uh, was right up there as well so uh, all of these obviously are, are of concern and we're going to go through each one of them in a little bit more detail, but very interesting to know where we all land. And we will spend a lot of time tonight speaking about traditional foods and ingredients and how to navigate that in a country. But let's start off with airline travel. And the most important point of all here is research your airline and call them in advance, get in touch with them. Most require advanced notification in order to make any type of, not of accommodation. I actually recently booked a flight where I had a pop-up come up in the booking process online asking me if I had a peanut or tree nut allergy for the sake of providing accommodations. In this case, it was to not serve nuts on board. So this was ideal, but this was the first time I've ever seen that. So it's really important that you are proactive in getting in touch with them to find out what they offer. Um, find out if they serve your allergen. Do they serve it throughout the plane or only in certain sections like the business class? So know what you're walking into and feel free to ask them if there's flexibility in what they serve. And this goes without saying, but bring extra epinephrine, bring more than usual uh, and obviously keep it in your carry-on so it's with you on the plane, not in your, your luggage underneath. Although I've never been asked for a doctor's note myself going through airport security, I've heard of rare occurrences when someone was asked for proof. So if you want to play it safe, get one. On the day of your flight, it's a good idea to tell the flight attendant before boarding the plane about your food allergies. You know, that's the time before or they're inundated with all of these passenger requests on the plane so you can have a little bit of interrupted one-on-one -on -one time. You can ask them if you are allowed to pre-board to wipe down your tray table, um, that immediate area around you. Some airlines make onboard announcements to other passengers. So find out what they offer, make a decision on what you personally are comfortable with. And the last point here, I can't stress this mantra enough, uh, do not eat airline food. 
I personally pack the most, and I don't want to boast too much here, but the most incredible sandwiches and snacks. I, I pack them the night before and I put a lot of thought and effort into it. So I don't even have the temptation to eat the airline food. And I actually feel that my food is much, much better. And people are looking at my tray and what I've got instead of what they're getting. So that, that to me is very important. You're not taking the risk. Sometimes it might be unlabeled food, but really you're so high up in the air, stick with something that you know and that you trust from home. So I asked all of our panel members for their top tip when traveling. And we're going to start off with Marion, and hers is related to calling airlines. So Marion, maybe you can share what you say to an airline when you're doing that initial research. Um, hi everyone. Um, I like for me, I mentioned I'm not ashamed of my food allergy, so I mention it right when I'm booking the flight, and I also call the airline uh, a few days or a few weeks before my flight just to double check everything's okay. And then I'm also Muslim. So that adds another dietary restriction. So I have to specifically mention halal, like, because while I would love to be able to pack food, like meat products are not one of the things airlines uh, are like too keen on uh, on their flights. So I have to mention specifically halal food, plus my food artisans, um, but just, what I do is call call them when I'm booking and tell them what my food origins are and how it's serious, it's not a dietary fad, and call ahead a, a few days before my flight so that everything's double checked and there's no surprises. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Miriam. And I think what's really impressive, Miriam is, is our youngest panelist and um she she told me earlier that um she's starting to take ownership over all of these phone calls and and doing her due diligence from her parents so uh, i commend her for that she's doing such a great job so thank you Miriam, for for sharing all that next we're going to explore uh the number one vote in that poll we did earlier eating in other countries so looking at food in a little bit more detail so there's a lot to consider and research, research, research is key here. And the more that you learn in advance, the less surprises you'll have while you're traveling. And that's really important. And this is true for restaurants where you can research safe options in advance and just simply make them part of your itinerary and research them online as, as much as possible. I know Danielle will be sharing some really helpful tips on this in a couple of minutes. When dining out, inform them of your food allergies and the severity. So it's important for them to understand that it is a very serious thing. Do not make assumptions about what you're about to eat. Foods might be similar, you might recognize the name, but it might be made with different ingredients, it might be a different recipe altogether. The picture on the top right there is, it looks like a, a coffee, but this is taken when I was in China a couple years ago and I ordered something called milk tea which I somehow figured was just tea with milk and sure enough that came with a cap on it and I thought you know what I should probably just double check this and I put a spoon in gave it a stir and there was something at the bottom and I pulled it all up and it was just filled with crushed almonds sliced almonds as you can see so it was a real eye-opener for me that not only allergens can be in foods, but also in different drink recipes. So to just be completely vigilant when, when abroad. Packaged foods. We are used to French and English on labels, and, uh, but in dozens of countries in Europe, like this picture, the one below the, coffee, the milk tea one, uh, you'll see a lot of text on there. And I believe there's about 14 different ingredient lists in 14 different languages. So that's a lot to navigate when looking at a package so i personally spent a lot of time in the tiny country of slovenia and i'm actually now pretty comfortable reading ingredient lists in slovenian i know all of my allergens in that language and sometimes when i look at a package english is not always present so i am looking through the slovenian text but 
Usually, hopefully you can find English on it, but if you're not sure, obviously do not eat it. Don't, don't take that chance. So just to let you know that ingredient lists can be very, very complicated overseas, and it can be a very good idea to bring your own food from home, to pack it with you instead of looking at these uh, foreign labels. Fresh foods in a grocery store are a very, very good place to start. Um, there you're gonna find around the perimeter of the store, the fruits, the vegetables, the dairy. You can speak with people there, whether it's in a bakery, whether it's the meat department, so you can actually have those conversations. Um, the other point I wanted to make about labels is um, know the common allergens in the country you're going to and know that they if they receive special status on the labels and how they call them out. For example, if they put common allergens in bold on the labels, in Canada, we have 10 priority allergens. There's eight in the US. There's a top 14 in Europe. I think it includes celery, lupin, seed, crustaceans, and mollusks separately. And I know the International Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Alliance, they have great country-specific resources with this information and much, much more. And I'll share a link to that at the very end. And we also have really helpful info along these lines at allergytravels.com. In the next slide, I want to show a chart from the University of Nebraska. And this is really interesting. It highlights how different these common allergens can be over a dozen countries here listed across the world. So you can see it's a, quite a wide range of foods that are considered common priority allergens in different countries. The different colors you see, uh, it breaks down these categories even further into specific classes of food within that. So it gets even more specific, but it just goes to show if you are expecting the same allergens, common allergens in labeling treatment that you have in Canada, it might be different to the country, to, in another country that you're going to. So that's a good thing to know before going to, that, to your country. We're gonna have another tip from one of our panelists. So I'm gonna ask Danielle to talk a little bit more about what she does to find out safe restaurants before she goes on her trip. So Danielle, take it away. Hello again, everybody. So my travel tip is to look up a few restaurants with high ratings before you go. Some allow you to search for keywords like allergies and that might lead you to helpful info or to a contact to ask more questions. I've done this pretty much every time I've traveled anywhere. I find going on any major travel forum they have a search option where you can search other people's reviews. So I go to a city that I know I'm going to, so let's say Reykjavik in Iceland, search the restaurant reviews for words like allergy, intolerance, special diet, and it'll give me a pretty good understanding of if that restaurant will be a good place for me or not, and pull up some that other people have had a good experience at. Um, I also try searching for the foods I'm allergic to, because the restaurant might not necessarily have reviews that specifically mention allergies, but they might have 500 reviews that mention their great peanut pasta, and then I'll know that I need to steer clear of that place. I specifically rule out vegan restaurants and any tag as vegan, just due to my specific set of allergies, because a lot of vegan places use soy or pea protein as their major protein source, so I know it won't be safe for me. But a lot of people have success looking for reviews that are tagged with vegan or gluten-free because that shows they have some basic understanding of special diets. And after I've made a list of a few potential restaurants, I contact them. I typically like contacting them on social media because then you can see if they've seen the message. And I ask them generally if they have the ability to accommodate allergies I list what I'm allergic to, and I give an example of what I would order. So when I went to Iceland, I messaged a restaurant and said, hi, I'm severely allergic to peanuts, soy, and peas, and I was wondering if it would be possible to pan fry a salmon filet in a clean pan separated from my allergens. Are you comfortable serving customers with allergies? And their response was perfect. They said it would be no problem. But doing that same thing, I also ran into a pizza shop that I thought would be completely fine. It only had three pizzas on the menu, but one of their new ones was a peanut butter pizza that wasn't listed on their website, wasn't listed on these travel reviews. 
And I was able to rule that out and save time when I was there by knowing it wasn't safe. Thanks so much, Danielle. And I, I, I think the real key piece of information there, we live in a day and age where every single company and restaurant has a social media presence. And that's such a great idea to get in touch with them that way, because it's all about their, their customer service uh, on those channels. So thank you so much for those great tips. We're now going to look into language barriers and English is a very common in most countries, uh, especially in the tourist areas. I was in Rome a couple years ago and I was really surprised how fluent wait staff spoke English in those main touristy areas and, and really understood my request when it came to my food allergies. So that's a, a great tip in itself in, in trying to stick to the touristy areas. But allergies may not always be prevalent, as prevalent in some countries and may not be as fully understood. And in some cases, wait staff may have covered the basics in English and they you might find they're trying to appease you by just saying yes yes no problem but it's up to you to ask questions and to really make sure that they get it so don't just take their word for it with a yes yes no problem but really ask your questions ask about cross-contamination issues in the kitchen ask what are the ingredients of the of this food are do you recommend safe foods for me so really try to get a gauge of where they are with, with food allergies. And um, if you're not comfortable, walk out. There's other restaurants. Translation cards can be a very valuable asset. Uh, they are in their mother tongue that you can hand them to the chef, to the wait staff, and it really just helps in, in less chance of your, your allergies literally getting lost in translation. So that's a really great tool to help them understand your allergies and take it a bit more seriously. Tours are a great, great idea. I actually um, had a incredible successful tour in Havana in Cuba, where my guide Carlos, he was just such a great liaison between myself and the chefs at restaurants that we went to during that trip. So uh, it, it was just a personal helper to make sure that nothing was lost in translation. He wanted to make sure everybody was completely satisfied with their tour. So that's just another tip that considering a tour can really help you um, help you communicate with chefs that way as well. This next slide um, is a chart created by the EF Education First organization. They're a global education company focusing on language um, and education. And essentially, I find it really helpful to have an overall feel for how proficient a country is at English before I go. So this is just an example of, of a chart where you can see, you know, from high to low um, proficiency of English. So just another example of some of the preparation that you can do before you go to have a little bit more comfort, get a better feel for the country that you're visiting. I believe we have another tip coming up. This time it's from Julia about translation cards. So Julia, perhaps you could share a little bit more. Have you used them before? How, how have they been received? Yeah, so ever since I started traveling on my own without my parents, translation cards are an absolute must for me and they have changed the way I've traveled with, uh, with my allergies. So my tip for you guys would be to bring as many translation cards with you as you can and give them out freely to restaurant staff and chefs. So whenever I enter a restaurant on my first night, whether it be um, whether it be off like on a resort or whether it be in a town, the first thing I do is ask for the manager, and they usually can understand what that word is, um, even if even if they don't speak the language very well, and give them my translation card. That way, there is no miscommunication or any mistranslation with what my allergies are and the severity of my allergies. I also think the more translation cards you have, the better. Because when I've been, and I've taken my translation cards to Mexico, to Cuba, to Costa Rica, I'll be bringing them to Italy this summer. Um, I've actually had managers ask to keep them because they're so um, they're so amazed at the amount of detail on them that they want to show the other staff. Um, so I let them keep them and then I have other ones that I can hand out freely um, again for another night. 
Um, and it's also great in case you forget them somewhere or they get damaged. So in order to prevent any type of miscommunication or mistranslation between yourself and the manager or the wait staff, it's best to give it something in their own home language. Thanks, Julie. I fully agree. You know, I, I remember using using them uh, once last year where it was the difference between a waitress just, okay, I, I, yep, sure. And her face lighting up when she saw the card, like, aha, I get it. I understand. So moving on, we're going to go to emergency services. So bringing extra auto injectors is very, very important. Enough for an emergency and enough in case you aren't able to get more after that fact. So bring more than you normally would at home. Remember that there's different emergency numbers for different countries. We're used to 911, but the standard is 112, for example, across Europe. Many European countries, I believe it's 999 in the UK, it can change from around the world. So research that in advance. Insurance is very important. So find a company that covers you specifically for anaphylaxis ask for ask specifically for that when you talk to them over the phone or you're communicating through email hopefully you won't need to use it but at least you'll have that peace of mind knowing that you're covered and you really do not want to be worrying about the cost of medical care during a reaction impacting your judgment to get help so just get insurance very important wear medical identification uh, I, I wear a medical alert bracelet personally uh, I also have a necklace that I wear sometimes. I do a lot of solo traveling and that bracelet can let other people know what's wrong in an emergency, especially a first responder. And I understand that they are trained around the world to look for this type of uh, identification when arriving at an emergency scene. So that's really important to me that I literally wear my allergies on my sleeve and bring extra cash. And this is a personal tip just from experience from a couple unrelated health predicaments where having US money with me made the difference and having a doctor come to me at my hotel, my resort versus having to go out and navigate a complex medical system. So obviously you wanna be calling emergency services for an emergency, but uh, having US money with you or cash with you, I found has, has made a difference in helping out in some of these smaller foreign countries. And here's just a, a map showing uh, countries that have epinephrine auto injectors readily available. So that's a lot of spots that do not. So in other words, bring your own, do not rely on the country to provide you new ones, bring enough extra ones. So you, you will be covered for all situations during your trip. And the next tip, we are going to throw it over to Ariane. So Ariane, take it away. Thanks. So I get ready to travel by making lists. So deals on hotels or airlines, what to pack, I mean, you name it, I list it, but it definitely carries over to when I'm getting ready to travel with my food allergies. So some examples of lists that I like to make for peace of mind are what to pack on a plane. So things like medication, auto injectors, antihistamines, cleaning wipes, where to eat once I get there. So safe restaurants, contact information for those safe places to eat, common cuisines and what could be a potential risk for my food allergies, close by grocery stores and what they might have on stock in case I need to make my own food. I also like to list things like important facts about the places that I'm visiting. So labeling laws in the country like we covered before, languages and alternative words for my allergens just in case. And just in case of emergency, I also like to know where close by hospitals or emergency services are along with contact information. And finally, most importantly, I like to list foods that I'm going to pack for myself so I know I'll always have something to eat. Thanks. Wonderful. I, I only wish that you had templates for all of us for your list. This sounds wonderful. So being organized, having it all on paper, having it all on your phone, this is so important, it's just so nothing slips through the cracks. And as you said, when you're when you're actually on your trip, you just it's easy. You can just refer to your list. Thanks so much, Ariane. And the last challenge we're just going to talk about are accommodations. And there are a few things to consider when making a plan for where you're going to stay. Perhaps you want to cook your own food, 
or you have a dog or cat allergy affecting where you'll stay. Uh, but most importantly, choose a place that you'll feel comfortable with and has the amenities that you'll need. Resorts can be tricky in terms of the communal buffet style eating areas that are very common. So call in advance, find out what they provide if they do special plated or customized meals. I have been to a resort before and, and was quite pleased by the individual restaurants that were on site and the personal service that I received from the chef. So it is definitely doable. Hotels are the most readily accessible type of accommodation. I try to book places with a mini fridge so I can at least source some of my own food and keep it in my room. Looking for places with a kitchenette in the room can also be a big help too. Personally, I use Airbnb the most out of all options these days. And I, I love that there are so many filters that help you choose a space that's really suitable for you and your preferences. I start by clicking no pets because of my dog and cat allergy. Um, but I also like to have access to a kitchen. And with that, I, trip, I typically then bring my own sponge, a clean sponge and some dishware, just to make sure I can keep it clean and keep it to myself. I went on exchange way back when, when I was in university to Sweden, and I shared a residence kitchen with 25 others from around the world. And it was as clean as you could imagine it would be. So in this case, I really just kept all of my food in my own room, in my own dorm room, along with my own personal set of dishes and sponge. So I kept it all to myself. It was pretty straightforward, um, but I made sure I was still involved in creating my own safe dishes uh, when we had communal dinners, which we had at least once a week. So I would have my safe dishes for that and share those accordingly. So we have covered a lot of ground tonight already, uh, the general basis, but we're now gonna dig a little bit deeper. It's time to get into questions with our panel. So just a reminder, if, you, if we haven't covered it already and you have more questions, you can submit those through the question box on the console. We did receive quite a few questions when people registered for this webinar. So we're gonna be starting off with many of those. And uh, in the meantime, feel free to think of more and submit them. So we'll start off with a question for Danielle. How to manage peanut or nut allergies in foreign non-English speaking countries? Hello again, everybody. So my answer to this is kind of a multi-part answer here. So before I go anywhere, I research what the native languages are in that country. And I have the words for my allergens in all of those languages written on a piece of paper that I keep with my passport so they don't get lost, as well as saved in a note on my phone. For me personally, reading labels and being able to communicate in written form is more important than by oral communication because I typically travel alone and I don't like to eat out when I'm traveling alone. So I just need to be able to read a label on my own. So I actually moved to Finland when I was 19 and I kind of joke that I'm label fluent in Swedish and Finnish now because those are the native languages of Finland. I can't speak or write on my own or ask for directions or anything, but if someone hands me an item of food, I can pretty well figure out what is in that item. And at the very least, if it contains my allergens, so, of course, there will be words that you don't know. So for those, I like to have a translation app handy so I can translate what the words are, because I like to know exactly what's in my items before I eat them, not just knowing that they don't have my allergens, but knowing exactly what's in it. Um, there are some apps that are just coming out that let you take a photo of an entire ingredients label and then you can highlight individual words and it'll translate them for you. Obviously, those are not foolproof. I still need to do my part and at least be able to recognize the words for my allergens, but it helps with knowing what else is in the item on a very basic level. And my final tip in this section, um, I also find the native word for the word allergy in the country that I'm going to. And I run a search for any Facebook groups that have that word in it. So I've found Danish, Swedish, and Icelandic groups by doing this. And I've had really great experiences getting restaurant and brand recommendations from them. I actually, in the Iceland group, connected with a girl who was around my age and 
two weeks before I was going to Iceland, she was coming to Toronto. So we were able to give each other brand ideas, restaurant recommendations. And then when we went to each other's respective countries, we exchanged contact info so that if either of us had any problems, we had someone we could contact over there. That's wonderful. And what a great tip to search out your literally the word allergy, your allergy in that language and, and seeing if there, there are any online groups. That is a really great tip. And, and as we know, the food allergy community, everybody wants to help each other. And that's an international thing, which is great to see. So thank you for that tip. Uh, the next question, uh, tra traveling to the Caribbean for the first time, how do you navigate meals at the hotel? So I know, Julia, you have some experience traveling to the Caribbean. Do you want to take this one on? Yes, I have a lot of experience traveling to the Caribbean. So if I were to have to say how many times I've been to the Caribbean, it'd probably be between 8 and 12. It's a lot. Um, so I'm very well versed in eating there. So I would definitely say do not take the chance and eat at the buffet if you are staying at a resort. Um, I've never eaten at the buffet. What I have done, though, is um, with my allergy translation cards, I will go into the buffet on the first night and find the manager. So the one that is in the suit is always the manager. They will tell you that it's the man in the white hat. It is not the man in the white hat because they're all wearing white hats. It is the guy in the black suit. So you go to the man or woman in the black suit and you give them their translation card. From my experience, 99% of the time, they, the manager speaks fluent English. So the, um, the conversation flows very easily. So what, in my experience, what I've always requested, and you can't be afraid to request this, is for them to make your own special meal. So the reason why I do this is because it eliminates any kind of cross contamination, any kind of cross contamination from like other spoons and like other people's plates from grabbing things from the buffet. And I'll always go and they'll ask me what I want and I'll say, oh, I want pasta, I'll want rice and chicken, um, and then they'll make it for me. Um, another huge tip that I have when you're traveling to the Caribbean is to just eat plain. Like, do not make any outrageous requests because that's when you start making complications like that, that's when the risk factors come in. So when, I, um, when I'm asking for food, I'll ask for pasta with tomato sauce or pasta with oil or chicken and rice. Nothing co more complicated than that because I don't want to start confusion and I don't want the risk factor for any type of cross contamination or may contain um, issues to arise. Um, another huge thing is uh, when I go to the Caribbean, I fill like half of my suitcase with snacks. So in my most recent trip to Cuba, I brought, I think, 12 instant noodle soups just in case I could not find options for me or just in case I left the resort and I didn't feel like having to get into the whole, here's my translation card, let's talk about my allergies if I just wanted a quick meal. So I found that that was really beneficial to me because for lunchtime, I would just grab a soup instead of having to go to a rest, a sit down restaurant or a buffet. Um, and I would just enjoy that. I also brought like chocolates and treats that I was able to have in case I did have any cravings. Cause I did see my friends eating a lot of uh, desserts and stuff like that. And in order to feel a little bit more involved and a little bit less left out, I had my own little I had my own little desserts with me. Um, from my experiences, the Caribbean has been absolutely amazing with allergies and they have, and nothing, uh, there has never been any miscommunication. Um, I did have an allergic reaction in the Caribbean when I was seven years old. Um, Again, it was it was my it was my fault, purely my fault. I was grabbing things and eating it and just putting it in my mouth uh, without my parents seeing. Um, and the staff was on it. Like I have never seen staff so on something before in my life. Um, I had gotten an ambulance and I was taken to the hospital so quickly. And at the hospital, they were able to understand what I was experiencing and react and treat me very, very quickly. So all in all, 
I highly recommend the Caribbean and it is something that is so doable to do with allergies as long as you prepare in advance. Great tips. That, that could be a guidebook in itself on the Caribbean with food allergies. Wonderful. Thanks, Julia. And I know a lot of, a lot of resorts and hotels there are starting to really tune into allergies and, and these needs for their guests and are starting to have processes in place. So getting people to identify right when they uh, make the booking or check in, and then there is a process to follow, whether it's meeting the manager right away or the food service director. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's wonderful that they're moving in that direction. The next question, we are going to go to Ariane. And the question is, can I carry epinephrine on an airplane? Hi, everyone. So yes, yes, of course you can. Um, so like we kind of talked about earlier, I suggest that you research your airline before you book just to see what kind of allergy po policy they offer you. So for me personally, I keep my auto injector with me at all times and I suggest everyone do the same. So I either keep it in my purse or my bag, which is at my feet, or I've even been asked to keep it in the travel pouch in front of me um, on, in the plane seat. Um, that's a good thing just in case you want you, the staff in the airline to know where it is and also your travel partner knows where it is all the time. And sometimes I've even given an extra auto injector with me. Uh, I've given an extra one to my travel companion to carry with them in a bag as well, just so they know where it is all the time. Wonderful. Thank you, Arianne. All right, let's get to Mary. I have a question uh, for her. And, and this is one that I'm really interested in. So Miriam, uh, pointed out before that she's been to Africa and this is a question that came in first um, with from our registry when in Africa are allergies common and do people understand your requests when you mention your food allergies there okay hi everyone um, well Africa is a very big continent so um, I'm only going to talk specifically to the part of Africa where I was, which is East Africa, which is Somalia, where I'm from, and even more specifically to the North Somalia, which is the area of Somalia where I'm from. So by no means am I an expert on all of Africa. I'm just talking about Northern Somalia, which is the area where I was, I'm from and where I visited. Um, to answer your question, from my experience, I don't think it's common, but it could also be lack of awareness where it is actually common, but people are, don't know how to get tested and how to get treated for it. Because the medical infrastructure over there is just getting started. So I minimized the amount of time I ate out when I was in Africa because, again, there's not much allergy awareness. And um, while I have no shame in discussing and explaining my food allergies, I just wasn't comfortable with the cro risk of cross-contamination and miscommunication, even though I spoke the language very fluently that they're they're speaking. So I just, if I did eat out, I went to a restaurant where they served rice and I, uh, like another panelist mentioned before, I kept it very simple and I had rice with chicken or rice with beef and because I'm not allergic to either one of those foods. But beyond that, I just ate at home where, like I, I was around family members that were aware of my food allergies. But even then, you have to be careful because I had an undiagnosed fish allergy at the time. Uh, I was a diagnosed here, so my aunt gave me some store-bought fish and I had a reaction. And that's where my travel insurance came in handy. And that's when my EpiPens came in handy. And that's when knowledge of mm, the medical clinics came in handy. But unfortunately, I had an allergic reaction halfway around the world. So like, oh, I had to treat that. <laughs> I had to treat that uh, luckily, it wasn't too severe, but I had to treat that. Um, and the last, well, I covered everything. What, what a what a unfortunate way to find out when you are traveling, but um, you took all the the right measures afterwards. Um, thanks for sharing that, Miriam. And you know, I, I I can relate to that when you are in a country where allergies aren't so prevalent, they it it, it can be tough and. You know, you did the right thing just by ordering something very, very simple, asking lots of questions, getting something like rice. I remember my trip to China. It was very similar in that I, I did not eat anything much more than that. So I fully relate. All right. We're going to get to some of the user submitted questions, some of the questions that you as an audience submitted throughout uh, the webinar and right now during the question period. 
And uh, before we get into some specific ones, I have a question that I'm going to ask all the panel members to just quickly respond with their answer. How many epinephrine auto injectors do you bring with you when traveling internationally? I know for me, it's probably around six. Uh, Ariane? Um, I carry anywhere between three to six. Danielle? Yeah, I, it depends on how long I'm going for. Like I went to Iceland for four days, so I only took three, but when I was traveling multiple countries over two months, I took five, I think. Julia? Um, I'm a little extra. I bring eight. <laughs> okay. There's no right or wrong answer as long as you have <laughs> more than the minimum. Uh, uh, Miriam, how many do you have with you when you, when you travel? Um, in general, I carry, uh, when I'm at, in Canada, I carry about three or four. So like I carry like a little bit over, so like 46 when I travel, um, just in, just to cover my bases so that if one expires or if one is not working or I don't have access to one, I always have something on me. Great. Just interesting, you know, and, and it just highlights there's no exact number that you need, but um, hopefully that gives you some perspective that just depends on the length of your trip. Uh, and your comfort level and different factors for you, how many you bring with you. Uh, the next question that came in, I'm going to give to Danielle. Um, I think she might have some experience with this one. If bringing your own food to ensure you have something safe to eat uh, is the thing to do, where do you research what food you can bring into a country? Yeah, so as a general rule, you can... I mean, do your own research before you go. You can just Google, if you're going to Italy, Google Italy customs food or something like that. You know, just words, not a whole sentence. Cause when you search for a whole sentence, your search gets confusing. And wherever you search, the search engine gets confused. So if you just search for the country, food and customs, you should get some information. I, I've brought meat and cheese on a plane and when I've gone through security in Canada, told the security people it's to eat on the plane. It's my meal on the plane because of my allergies, because I can't have the food they provide on the plane and told them before they've told me this information, I make sure they're aware that I know it can't come off the plane when I get to my destination. Like it's coming on the plane, it's not going into the country. and as long as I provide that information to them, they've always been fine with letting me bring stuff on. But I think in general, packaged food has always been fine. It's just fresh fruits or anything like that, or meat and cheese, they don't really like you bringing out of Canada or into another country. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah, and I, I've, I've brought a, geez, a full suitcase full of food on, on a trip or two. and. I've really never had any issues uh, or, or questioning about it. So, um, and, you know, and keep in mind, there are a lot of those basic staples wherever you go, whether it's in Asia or Africa, that there is rice, there are, you know, very basic things that um, at least can get you started when, when you hit the ground running in a different country. So, um, but it, it is a really great idea to bring some food and, and try to find out, do some basic research of, of are there any restrictions there? Yeah, and I always kind of over declare what I'm bringing. Like, for example, when I came back into Canada, I had cinnamon buns with me and the customs form says, do you have any dairy? And I'm like, well, technically no, but there's dairy in the cinnamon buns and there's probably dairy in the chocolate I'm bringing back. So I always kind of over declare and just let them know I have it because it's easier to declare it than not declare it and have something go wrong. Great point. This next one is, I'm going to pose to Julia. Um, I hate flying because airline food almost never has ingredients listed and I can't control what people around me eat. Do you have any tips? Yes. Um, no, you can't control what everyone around you is eating, but before getting on the plane and a couple of panelists have already mentioned this before, it's so important just to speak to the staff on board, uh, whether or not they can make the entire plane 
nut or peanut uh, safe. Um, they probably can't guarantee all the time. I've been on planes where they've just had like three rows back and three rows forward, um, where they ask people to not eat nuts. And if they wanted to eat nuts, they would try and see if they could move their seats. Um, and again, wiping down your area to make sure that there's no type of cost contamination. But in terms of food, bring awesome food from home bring stuff that you really 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 like if you really if you really need to eat something on a plane like a trip to mexico or a trip to cuba you probably aren't don't need to eat it's only like a four or five hour flight um but if you are going somewhere a little bit further like greece or any anywhere in asia or anywhere in the middle east where you are going to be on the plane for a lengthy amount of time Bring something awesome from home that you know that you can have and that you really, really enjoy. Um, for me, I and I've said it before, I love soup, so I'll bring a couple of um, instant soups and I'll have a few in my carry-on case. And actually, and on my way back from Cuba, my I ended up handing some out to my friends because they also really liked it and they also really wanted it. Um, so yeah, don't feel left out. Don't feel, don't feel like you can't eat anything because you totally have control over what you can eat. If you really have to eat, take something that you, uh, bring something that you can have. Great answer. And I'm going to squeeze in one more. Um, are there any destinations that should be avoided when traveling with food allergies? Ariane, do you want to take this one? I'd also like to weigh on weigh in on this one. I think when you're traveling anywhere, you should always do online research. So regardless of where you're going, you should look up some of the common foods where you're going, common words for your allergens, local restaurants with top ratings, like one of the panelists mentioned before, what kind of dishes they might have, prominence of food allergies in that area. I think as long as we're prepared and we make lists, like I mentioned before, we should be okay. Thanks, Arianne. And I fully agree, you know, and, and that's really the overarching theme of today's webinar is you can't plan enough. You you can't research enough. The more you do, the more comfortable you're going to feel when you're actually there. And I personally don't think there, there are real countries that need to be avoided when traveling. I think the world's your oyster that you can, you can go see it all. Um, I remember, thinking my whole life I will never go to to Asia just because of my food allergies and uh, an opportunity arose to go to China and it and it took a lot for me to say I I can do this but um, I planned I planned I planned for months and I had it all down to a, a very very fine-tuned itinerary I'd bring my food I would buy a hot plate when I got there I would cook my food and I spent three weeks enjoying a beautiful country and culture and I, I really did not dine out at all. I, I stuck to my own food and that was fine because for me, travel is not all about food. It's about all of the other wonderful things that come along with it, meeting the great people, the cultures, the language. So, you know, I'll end on that for a question period that travel, you don't have to limit yourself, but the more that you, you, you do that legwork in advance, it's just gonna be such a rewarding experience for you and very empowering to know that you can travel the world despite this health condition. So here is a list of links for your consideration that can that we talked a lot about today with our own traveling tips on Food Allergy Canada's website. Allergicliving.com has an airline chart that's very helpful to describing some of the policies for major airlines for allergies. Airbnb.ca, which I mentioned, the international regulation chart that was the one with all of the different common allergens around the world um, and then there are allergy travel tips by country through the food allergy anaphylaxis alliance there's a link for that that's very very helpful and then there's a couple links for different companies for food allergy translation cards we would like to thank the organizations that made this webinar possible Pfizer, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation, and the Peanut Bureau of Canada. Food Allergy Canada is a nationally registered charity that relies on donations in order to provide services to support the food allergy community, like these ongoing educational webinars.
So please visit foodallergycanada.ca slash donate to learn more about the impact your donations will make. And lastly, thank you so much for your participation in this webinar. And we hope that you found this helpful and, uh, and useful as you plan your next trip. And please feel free to contact Food Allergy Canada with any follow-up questions that you might have. This now concludes the webinar. I also wanna thank our wonderful panel for their time and their knowledge that they shared with us today. So thanks everybody and safe travels.